Hello. So, uh, I've come down with acute viral nasopharyngitis, and I'm not sure if I'm going to make it. So this is going to be my last will and testament. Uh, it's late at night, and I've been thinking about some books. I have a few sitting here next to me, four to be exact, and uh, one of them is Ulysses, one of them is The Recognitions, one of them is the complete poems of James Elroy Flecker, and the other one is An Overcoat by Jack Robinson. They were chosen at random, and uh, I haven't... I don't know if I'm gonna actually include them in anything, but yeah, I just picked them up and took them with me. Right now I am residing in my old haunt and uh, it provides ample rumination. And uh, by the way, I recommend not watching this video. This is gonna be decadent probably my most decadent video yet and uh, I hope I don't upload it but uh, yeah I've been known to do worse uh, let's see here so it snowed today in Texas for about maybe two minutes and uh, there was no trace of it afterwards. I was reading a section of Ulysses at lunch today. And I don't know what section it is. It's like page 126. So I don't know what chapter that makes it. I just opened it up randomly. But uh, yeah, he talked about basically the death of the earth and how it'll become just a shell of a planet floating around, emitting no light. I thought that was pretty neat that he wrote about that back back then. I always think people back uh, like 100, 200 years ago didn't know anything about science, but there's another interesting poem in this, James Elroy Flecker. I'll get it here. Bear with me. Yeah, I really, I really would advise against watching this video. But here it is. This is called, To a Poet a Thousand Years Hence. I who am dead a thousand years and wrote this sweet archaic song, send you my words for messengers the way I shall not pass long. I care not if you bridge the seas or ride secure the cruel sky or build consummate palaces of metal or of masonry. But have you wine and music still, and statues and a bright-eyed love, and foolish thoughts of good and ill, and prayers to them who sit above? How shall we conquer like a wind that falls at eve our fancies below, and old Maimonides the blind said it three thousand years ago? O oh, friend unseen, unborn, unknown, student of our sweet English tongue, read out my words at night alone. I was a poet. I was young. Since I can never see your face and never shake you by the hand, I send my soul through time and space to greet you. You will understand. Uh, yeah, that's probably his best poem. So, but I was able to get this book for like three bucks. It's one of the uh, those cheap things, you know, that like the PDFs online, so they just print it. So, yeah, screw it. It was nice. And uh, let's see here. I also got the autobiography of Lenny Bruce called How to Talk Dirty and Influence People. And that's been on my mind along with the recognitions lately because William Gaddis was born in December of 1922 and then Lenny Bruce was born in 1925. And then my grandma was born in 1928, but... It's and uh, the interesting thing is that they write about a lot of the same things. Like, um, not really they write about the same things, but they write about different things in, with similar 
uh, goals or similar um, uh, well to give an example so if you don't know Lenny Bruce he's my favorite comedian he born in 1925 died in I think 66 drug overdose was a what is it, one of those comedians that like sat, satirizes society makes fun of people and uh, he got arrested for obscenity several times got arrested for uh, narcotics all this stuff he died when he was 40 I believe um, but in in his uh, stand-up comedy he uh, uh, he jokes around a lot with like religious figures or presidents or uh, police uh, makes fun of what they do makes fun of uh, how people treat words like back in the 50s you could get arrested for saying a cuss word on like in a private place where people have to ex consent to go there uh, you know like a nightclub or something and part of one of his trials there were nightclubs in the vicinity that policemen went to that had strip shows like literal people getting naked naked and uh, Lenny Bruce got arrested for saying cocksucker on stage and there are people literally getting naked and people in drag guys dressing up like women with high heels and Lenny Bruce says a word and gets arrested and uh, I think in a similar way because uh, Lenny Bruce really got popular like in the late 50s early 60s 57 59 and then the 60s he really like he went to Carnegie Hall and all this stuff but um, yeah the connection with William Gaddis he's uh, you know William Gaddis is like Well, one of his things is like he, uh, as he got older, his books got more pessimistic and he got more pessimistic, it seems, because he, it seems like one of his goals in his books was to let everyone know what they were doing. So then they'd have a, a moment of realization, say, ah, oh, like how silly I've been. I can't believe I did this for my whole life. And then they would, you know, by, by implication, like switch what they were doing. But of course that never happened and uh, that, you know his books are extremely good here maybe I can read a section from it I only dog-eared two pages in the whole book but I don't I don't do that much so I'll uh, let's see what, which one of these is well let's see oh yeah this is page 373 Yes, the what? The recognitions? No, it's Clement of Rome. Mostly talk, talk, talk. The young man's deepest concern is for the immortality of the soul. He goes to Egypt to find the magicians and learn their secrets. It's been referred to as the first Christian novel. What? Yes, it's really the beginning of the whole Faust legend, but one can hardly, eh? My, your friend is writing for a rather small audience, isn't he? Incidentally, the next time you borrow Loyola. So I gathered, but that's hardly the place to read Loyola. Do they have what in the Vatican? A mold for fig leaves? He stood for a moment, his eyes closed still, after he'd hung up the telephone and murmured, What can drive anyone to write novels? But thinking not of novels, nor the black mass, nor even the mold for fig leaves kept in the Vatican Museum, thinking instead and vainly of the dream which the telephone call had broken, Though he could not recapture it, re-enter it, could not alter, even in that wishful fabric, events of a quarter century before. So that's pretty good. That's a pretty good section there. And then uh, was this other one I did? I can never remember, unfortunately. Oh yeah, this is a good section. Finally, we can't even conceive of a continuum of time. Every fragment exists by itself, and that's why we live among palimpsests, because finally all the work should fit into one whole and express an entire perfect action, as Aristotle says. And it's impossible now. It's impossible because of the breakage. There are pieces everywhere. So 
So I thought that was a pretty good section. The, the lost scrapbook, etc., etc. So, yeah. Yeah, if you haven't read uh, The Recognitions, I'd recommend it. If you haven't listened to Lenny Bruce, I'd recommend it. Let's see here. What else? Um, oh, yeah. So, um, recently I've had uh, the privilege of talking to someone my age from America, like from, from a similar background as me. And uh, it was so interesting because they know like all the TV shows that I used to watch and all the toys that I used to play with and video games and movies. And uh, that, that was really weird for me because I've never had a good memory for those things. Like my younger brother could always pick out scenes from a TV show and say like, oh, do you remember this? And I would always say no. I could never remember it. I could never remember random scenes, even though I watched it just as much as anyone. You know, I watched it every day probably for a while. And then, uh, like, she would bring up these, like, these random quotes from things. And, like, quotes she doesn't even know where they're from. Like, she said, uh, today she quoted, you looking at me? Or wh whatever the quote is from Taxi Driver. And I was like, do you like that movie, Taxi Driver? She was like, I've never seen it. And I was like, you just quoted it. <laughs> she said, I don't know what I was quoting. But, yeah, it was pretty funny. But, yeah, I, I thought it was so interesting to uh, hear someone from my age group, like, talk. Which, um, I can only imagine how that makes me sound when I say that. But, in a similar way, uh, with Ulysses that I have sitting next to me here... I was thinking that if there was an Irish person born in, you know, whatever, Joyce was born in 1882, right? Yeah, 1882. Could you imagine being born in 1882 also, being a relatively educated guy, uh, you know, grew up in Dublin, whatever, and then reading Ulysses when you're 40 years old when it's first published? Like that, you must, like anyone who did that must have considered... Ulysses, the best book ever written in history, and it's it wasn't even close, probably. But I can easily imagine it going the other way, where uh, you know things too well, so you'll be like, "Oh, he missed that street. He he said it wrong," or like, because sometimes the characters will be walking down a street in Dublin, and I can imagine because I I don't think Joyce went to Dublin, like like however many years when he was writing the book so I imagine he made some like factual errors maybe not maybe he just had a map with him and made sure he was right which is probably probably what happened but yeah I think I can, so in that way I'm kind of imagining like someone my age writing a book that includes like you know like I was born in ninety five, so all these all this stuff from ninety five, like the remnants of Nirvana and grunge bands and like you know, Hey Arnold and the Rugrats and SpongeBob and all this stuff and like Pokemon and Yu Gi Oh. And that's just like the like the trivial references, but maybe even more more uh more immense things like constant war or the 2008 economic crash or uh, things like that but not not just mentioning it as like a token reference but actually giving an analysis of what it did to people like uh, in Lenny Bruce's autobiography he said uh, TV's ruined us like his generation and I think that's so interesting because uh, the way William Gaddis writes uh, he writes about TV a lot. He writes about advertisements, and uh, the way he writes about advertisements is really interesting. You can tell they were just inundated with them. Pro it's probably worse today, and we probably don't even realize it. Like, uh, I think I watched this interesting thing. This guy from Facebook, he's an Indian guy, like, you know, from India, and uh, he talked about how with social media, like YouTube, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, 
where they basically hack people's brains and uh, enable mass propaganda at uh, you know with greater ease than has ever been accomplished in history because uh, you know you put up a video like this like a completely uh, you know like a low low quality video you know if we're being generous and then like if people like it and then you're like oh wow you know like oh man that must have been a good video people liked it and then you're like oh man I'll put up another one but it's even worse if if uh, like uh, like vloggers or uh, like politicians or uh, what what is this thing? Oh yeah, on Instagram, this this Instagram model, who's just like a normal girl, was an influencer. That's what she called herself. Oh, I just posted pictures for a year and a half before I started influencing, and it's like, oh God, she doesn't even realize what she's saying because if she did, she'd never say that. It's like propaganda speak, and so these like moderately attractive women you know, like post like a shoe or something like that or like foot fetishist or something. But then they get paid like some money for how many people want, look at the shoe. And it's, and like, I think Joe Rogan talked about this where he was like, this girl just posts like pictures of her ass and there's like 8 million people following her just to look at that. And really he's right because he said th this sort of thing has never happened before in history. Eight million people are just looking at this girl's butt, looking at the skin of her butt, you know, just like probably like, you know, whatever. And, you know, the sort of power that that commands, like imagine if she just put out like a PayPal link or like a Bitcoin wallet uh, address. It was like, hey, I need $100 for some trivial thing. She'd probably get $10,000, you know, something like that. To eight million people there's there's a couple idiots in there you know a couple desperate people probably 40 50 year old overweight men you know whatever and uh yeah it's just really weird and uh i could only imagine that something like that would be written about also i just recently started reading this novel called amygdala tropolis by b.r yeager and it's and it's uh ostensibly about 4chan or like you know anonymous boards like board culture you know like hyper aggressive hyper violent like kill yourself you know that sort of like if you can call it humor it's almost not even humor it's you just imagine yourself laughing at it you don't even laugh but uh, I can imagine a good novel about our time period including something with that you know I don't know how it would be done but um, what else? What else? Uh, uh, recently, I've been also thinking, uh, I like to run through, like, random scenarios about, of my life, like, in the future. So I imagined at one point I'd become a nurse. I imagined I'd become, a, you know, some, some seedy internet hacker. I'd imagine I'd become, a, like, a high school teacher. I imagined I'd become a therapist or counselor and my my most recent one was the like teacher and I was thinking that because it's relatively good pay if you live in a uh, metropolitan area a large metropolitan area and uh, I think it would be relatively easy if I was a guy because I think more people would be willing to uh, like manipulate and pick on a female teacher, especially a young female teacher. But a guy, I think you re you'd have to get the really audacious ones to do anything. Like probably the, you know the the guys who uh, are you know have a drug habit already, or you know, uh, I don't even know, you know whatever they they could you know someone walk in there shoot at them and they'd like start laughing because it was interesting or something you know that type but yeah so I thought it'd be pretty interesting I don't know though it's just a possibility too many possibilities but yeah and uh, I noticed one other thing you know like the whole thing with Japan and the hikimori people 
I've noticed among like so I have two brothers and uh the younger one is uh five years younger than me. I don't want to go into it too much, but uh I also had a, a lady at my work who's about my brother's age. No no, not the lady, but her, the lady had a daughter who's about my brother's age. And uh she said you know, my daughter's a my daughter's a stay at home type or something like that. I can't remember how she phrased it. She likes anime and then you could tell that she had tried to watch anime and like, you know, extract some uh some positive things from it. And she was like the artwork is pretty interesting, you know, all this stuff, but it's like you know, that I, I see a lot of people, you know, going along with this, you know, 4chan, board culture, you know, Reddit, all this stuff. Like, fat neck beard, whatever the stereotype is. There have always been people, you know, like maybe like Emily Dickinson or whoever, who, uh, you know, self-exiled from society, but, or, you know, like, you know, hermits or whatever. But it seems like it's more of a societal uh, effect, a uh, societal effect. Maybe like, you know, mass shootings or something, you know. Uh, you know, mass shootings is one uh, emanation of the current state. And then shut-in, like shut inness somehow reflects the current state. And I'm not sure how it would. I'm not sure what causes it. Well, I could think of a whole bunch of trivial things, you know, like. Uh, helicopter parenting, you know, sheltering children, which is a, a, like an obvious phenomenon, uh, is also, you know, like that, that stereotypical 45 year old comedian, uh, everyone gets a trophy, you get a trophy for being the last winner, that sort of thing. But, uh, I really think it has to do with the parenting style that people take on now, you know, like with the news, you always hear about these like viral outbreaks, you know, all this stuff, or, uh, you know, a serial killer is, you know, like in your same state, but then, uh, you know, there's, there's like, you know, 20 million people between you and the serial killer. So the odds of your child being abducted are, you know, like you could, you could live a hundred lifetimes and your child wouldn't, wouldn't have been uh, abducted once, something like that. But you, you keep your child in your yard and they never realize what what the the outer world holds for them. So then, when they you know become eighteen, they they watch anime in their room and they're too afraid to uh, go outside. Something like that. I mean, that's that's a that's like a, cuts out a few steps, I think. But oh shoot, I just thought of something. Yeah, I I've noticed that uh, I kind of did this as an experiment because I noticed when I get sick, I. Uh, I can think, or I can at least talk more lucidly. Like, I can connect my my thoughts to my mouth. And I notice that's a problem I have with my writing. Because I don't know if it's the context of, of, of being a writer. You know, like William Gaddis talks about. Like, mo not many people want to write, but a, ho a whole lot of people want to be a writer. And I don't know if I'm, like, getting myself, you know, in the mindset. I just watched this thing with... It was a, a talk with Oprah, Charles Barkley, and uh, Michael Jordan. And uh, Charles Barkley has this like twitch where when he's golfing, he like even when he's practice swinging, like when he's practice swinging, he can go, he can golf perfectly, you know, swing the the uh, whatever the driver. But then when he gets a when he has to actually hit a ball, he like. He, he like glitches, you know, like he swings, it stops, and then continues, follows through. And, uh, you know, I wonder if it's that sort of context, like whenever I sit down to write, I think, okay, I'm going to write. And then I write in this, like, an odd style that I imagine that a writer would write in, you know, if one was going to write. But I've always found the most interesting uh, types of writers are the ones that seem like they write lucidly and whether or not they do I think some do but some uh, some affect a lucid style I think like um, 
uh, I always get the impression that Robert Walser was just like sitting down and just, you know, just like, you know, slam something on the page and he's like, uh, yeah, you know, like, fuck it. Like, yeah, throw it out there, you know, it's good. Or like, uh, who else? Well, obviously Frank O'Hara, but his is more like, his is more uh, like concerted, I feel like. He was like, I'm going to be spontaneous now, like that. But uh, let's see here. Yeah, I forgot what I was saying. I forgot where I was going with that. Uh, let's see here. Uh, yeah, there was this baby, a three-year-old baby, that was uh, in the drive-through today at the pharmacy, and he was he was uh, completely bare except for a diaper, because he was allergic to his own sweat. And uh, it was cold outside, hot in, hot in the SUV, and his parents had to strip him down so he wouldn't, because he started to sweat, and it was uh, very uncomfortable for him. So parents stripped him down in the back of like a seat, and because he, cause he was allergic to his own sweat. It's, uh, isn't that weird? You know. Uh, yeah, one phrase I heard: uh, a fat minute. You know. Yeah, have you ever heard that? A fat minute. I'll see you in a fat minute. Yeah, I use that today to, re to refer to a half an hour. I know some people say like a hot minute, you know, like a, so like it's short. Or like quick, you know. Uh, oh yeah, I recently got another interesting book. Uh, Phantom Africa by Michel Leris, some French guy, friends with, friends with Georges Bataille, and uh, yeah, it's a pretty good book, published by Siegel Books, I think I already talked about this, but uh, yeah. Dang, I'm losing, I'm losing my steam, how long does this go on for? 27 minutes already, man. I can't even imagine. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I've been reading this book by uh, Ricardo Piglia, the one I just made my last video on. It's The Diaries of Emilio Renzi, and it's the first part. It's the formative years, and... I was thinking how uh, really the my favorite type of writing from a writer is like diary form or uh, like imitating a diary. And really, in a way, uh, Ulysses does that. Um, let's see. Um, like Proust does that, uh, like stream of consciousness kind of, you know, alludes to that whenever it appears. And uh, I think why I like it, because when I was thinking about like five years ago, I was thinking, why do I like to read? Because it's kind of a weird thing, really, you know, just staring at little like little, little black things on a piece of paper. It's really kind of a weird thing. Like if you saw another animal do it, you'd be like, "Like, dude, like, like, what the? What are they doing?" But then you know, of course, we do it, and it's normal. But it's really weird. And I, I realize that the reason I do it is I read uh, most of the time for the psychology of the writer, the psychology of the writer, and uh, the person, like a person who wrote it. And I was thinking, like, you know. That's so weird. That's so convoluted because, you know, most, of, you know, I think it's more reasonable to read for the psychology of the characters in the book. Because, like, you can relate to this character, you hate this character, whatever, you know. Oh, uh, you know, it's brothers in the book. You know, I have a brother, whatever, like that. And, but I realized I don't really, I, you know, of course everyone can relate to the characters, you know, whatever. But I realized for the most part I was relating with the author 
whenever I like to book. Whenever I really like to book. And uh, that does pose some uh, snags because, you know, when you get an author like... Um, and this is hard because I include the biography so much in everything I read. So it's hard for me to pick an author that I that I uh, that I read and I um, would hate them as a human being. Um, yeah, I can't think of an excellent example, but a popular example: uh, Louis Ferdinand Celine. I just read uh, Gall Gallimard or whatever. The French publisher is postponing their printing of his anti-Semitic pamphlets. And, uh, you know, I never made it through his journey, uh, journey to the end of the night because it was, you know, I, I knew the sort of person that would write it. It's obvious. And uh, I would have disliked them thoroughly. I would have disagreed with everything he said and we would have hated each other. We, you know, if we were in like the same circles, like if I was some French guy born in 1892 and we went to college together and we were in the same class, you know, I would try to be smarter than him and I'd laugh, I'd laugh at him when I was, you know, that sort of thing. And, and but then, you know, get an author like, uh, you know, whoever, Pessoa, you know, he, he has his quirks. Like if you read his letters, he wrote to that uh, one girl can't remember her name, but, uh, yeah, he's, he says, like, he calls himself, like, Uncle B or something, like, like, B-E-E, -E, you know, or, no, he said, he refers to her as, like, my little B, and then he says, or, like, the reasons, he lists, he makes a list, like, the three reasons why uh, you should talk to me, or the three reasons why I like you, and then he he goes to the fourth reason, he says, and the fourth reason is that there's no fourth reason because I said there'd only be three reasons, you know, kind of weird stuff like that. Like, you could tell he had gotten so, like, lonely and, like, his imagination was just overflowing that he couldn't help but include people around him in his, like, not really fantasies in the, like, picadillo sense, you know, but, yeah, just, like, fantastical imaginings, you know, where he just kind of, you can imagine his dream world seeping into the real world. And, uh, yeah, I think, I think that happens to a lot of people who, for whatever reason, are lonely in their childhood or teen years, you know, which seems to be a, uh, a commonality among writers. Uh, but I always feel like I get along best with people who don't get along with other people very much. Whether you know whether it be for one reason or another, you know it could be because they they may have a, a like a like a rough personality in the beginning. That's kind of one thing I've always noticed. Like I've been interested in people. Like when I first see them, I'm just like hmm, they're interesting. Like they do something weird. But then I'll even try to be friends with them, even if they, like, make me go through, like, a trial period, like, where they're like, uh, you know, I don't want to talk to you, and I'll be like, are you sure? And then, uh, you know, I keep going like that. But if it's just a random person, like, if it's just a random person, I'll just be like, you know, like, like fuck it, you know, they don't want to talk to me, screw it, I don't want to talk to them, that sort of thing. But if it's like an interesting person, it doesn't get to the point, you know, where, you know, excessive anything, but it's just like, you know, it's like, hmm. Yeah, I, uh, yeah, I like talking to old people a lot. Like I recently met this old guy, he's a pharmacist. He's been a pharmacist since like 1964 or whatever he says. 1967, I think, maybe. And, uh, yeah, he was really interested in quantum physics. And he said, yeah, if I had a higher IQ, I would have been a quantum physicist or something like that. And uh, he really liked Richard Feynman. I really like Richard Feynman. He's one of my favorite guys to watch on YouTube. Just listen to his talks to help me go to sleep. And, uh, like, Lenny Bruce is my other one. I just listen to them. You know, to help me go to sleep. But 
I found it so weird because, uh, you know, he's a 74-year-old guy and I'm 22. You know, that's a huge gap. But I really felt more, uh, like, I felt more akin to him than I do almost anyone I meet my age. Like, I have that basic, like, oh, it's a young person, I'm a young person type of connection that you just do. Like, oh, you know, you know, like, or whatever, you know, they're struggling with college payments and, you know, they think Trump's an idiot or something like that. Like, you know, I can relate to them like that, like in a like really basic sense. But then for old people, I feel like I relate to them and like, like, I feel like I'm an old person, basically. Like, I feel like if you just were like, you know, pulled my brain out of my ear and just like slipped it in a 65 year old man or woman's body, they no one would be like, something's up, something's afoot. Because I ask a lot of people, like, what music they like, or, you know, just somehow we get talking about music, and I ask them if they listen to, I don't know, Creedence Clearwater Revival, and they say, that was before my time, or something like that, and it's like, then how do I know about it, you know? It's before my time. It's way before my time, all this stuff. But yeah, I don't know. I just, uh... Yeah, I just, like, I have, like, some serious... So first of all, I have, like, serious post-nasal drip. And so I wake up with a sore throat, and then my... I feel like my brow ridge is... Is in strife, you know. It's pressure, some serious nasal pressure up there. Oh man, you know, there's nothing like being sick to make you feel alive. You know, just, just, you know, you're just excited for tomorrow. But um, let's see what else. Yeah, I, I, I know. This is like a, like a cliche, but I always feel like I wish I was older, not in the sense that, um, not in any specific sense, but it's just, um, you know, if I was older, I would have all this, like, all this bullshit out of the way. And of course I know that's somewhat ridiculous because if you're old, you just have more shit to deal with. You know, it's not really like, but it gets kind of repetitive when you're like, when you plan out some amount of time, you know, any halfway intelligent person can come up with the most reasonable course of their life. And yeah, you have no idea what's going to happen, but you can probably get pretty close for any, like living in the third world country, you're going to be like, okay, you know, I may be one of that one out of a thousand that gets cancer and dies a horrible death, but. Most likely I'll live to be 70 something. Most likely I'll die before my wife, you know, whatever. And it's like, most likely, you know, I'll have a whole bunch of funerals. I have to go to a whole bunch of weddings, you know. You can pretty much guess your life. If you have a certain career that's more stable than another, you're, you know, going to be a teacher, you know, this, this is going to be a long life sort of deal. But, you know, it gets kind of repetitive when you're like, okay, I need to get an A, and then you get an A, and then, uh, oh, I need to drive here, and then you drive there. Uh, you know, you memorize all the books in a bookstore, you go there, and it's the same books, and you're like, you know, well, shit, you know, why did I even go here, you know? And then inevitably, you know, you find something you didn't memorize, or there's a new book. But then even that, to an extent, like, uh, I was horrified when I was 17, I looked at these pictures of space, you know, like the Eagle Nebula or uh, uh, like high resolution NASA pictures of Andromeda or, you know, our neighbor galaxy. And I was horrified that I would never be able to see those for the first time again. Because, you know, after you see them for the first time, you know, maybe something completely astonishing like the Eagle Nebula, you look at it a couple hundred times and you're still like, damn. But then it becomes repetitive no matter what. 
and uh, that was an interesting thing I saw. Uh, there was this one video, it's on Cut, the YouTube channel, and they do like a uh, hundred people tell us their fear, or a hundred people tell us their favorite, uh, you know, whatever. I don't know what it is, but the last one that I watched was a hundred people tell us the last time they had sex, I think it was. And one guy was like, yeah, it was, it was like yesterday, but you know, we're trying to have a baby or like, we're trying to have a kid. So it gets to the point where you're just like, you know, well, I guess it's time, you know, we haven't tried in the last couple of days. And it's like, but I think most people, you know, especially my age would be like, Oh, I can't even imagine being like that. It's, you know, they'd be like, Oh man, I, I feel like that. I'd be lucky. I'd be, I'd be the luckiest guy on earth, man. But then, you know, it's very easy to imagine that you just get to that stage where you're just like, oh, you know, like a, like, like a, you know, pump robot or something. I don't know, whatever it is, but yeah, it's just, I think that's one interesting thing. And my friend sent me a paragraph written by Leopardi about this, where, uh, Leopardi said in like the early 1820s that it's, it's either impossible or very difficult for a sensitive and contemplative person to enjoy life without a uh, significant amount of despair. And I think also included in the implication was like this person is empathetic and uh, imagines themselves as being other people quite easily. And uh, I think that's probably correct. And the thing I, the person I thought about most with this is uh, Cesar Vallejo, because he was a very empathetic person, you can tell by his poetry. And, um, I imagine he suffered quite a lot with that. But, uh, yeah, I don't know, I guess I'll end it here. I don't want this to get too long because if it gets too long my phone cuts it in half and then I have to put it on my computer which takes like two hours and that's like pain in the ass so hopefully it didn't do that I think it did though 42 minutes damn but yeah I have a uh, complete works of Lawrence Stern coming in the mail from 1857 so I'm looking forward to that yep and I have a Shakespeare class that I'm going to be taking uh, with some kids in a Chinese university, we're going to do it, you know, virtually. Not virtually, but, you know, video. So that'll be neat. In like three days. In three days, that's going to happen. Alright, yep, death is a gang boss. I apologize. Please forgive me for this video.